thank you for inviting me back and uh, nice to see you all. Thank you for putting your Saturday morning on stop to uh, have a listen to some hairy bloke from Barnsley. Uh, have a little chat about uh, the business that I set up many years ago. Um, and uh, I've literally come back from the Eden Project. There's an event there called Anthropy which is well worth uh, Google and see what it's about. It's basically the UK Davos, um, and it's there to make Britain a better place uh, and a more sustainable place. So, uh, yeah, it's it, it it was interesting chatting to many, many people here how what was quite radical and uh, business model, you know, years ago when I started it is now people don't look at it as kind of out there and weird they're, they're actually wanting to emulate elements of it for their own organization so you know just um hopefully you'll you'll have it make you think about what business is about why you want to be a business person and uh the positive impact that you can make not just for your own family of course which is very important but for wider society as well. So I, I, I call the business model Marxist, Marxist capitalism, uh, and it's kind of an evolution on uh, from um, conventional economic capitalism that you, you, you're taught, to, taught at in many, many textbooks. Um, and I, I, I don't see it as a revolution. I do see it as an evolution, and you'll hopefully uh, agree with me. Uh, that it 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 gives people a framework to think differently, to act differently, to create successful economic value, but also to share it out, and that's where the Marxist principles come uh, come in. And I'll I'll run through that with you. Um, you can see my screen, okay? I'm assuming. Good. Yes, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. So, what I'd ask you to do for the short period of time we have together is to. Um, I will give you this inside track on how it works and what it is and how a distinctly different business model can be um, effective and sustainable for the long term. Uh, all I'd ask you to do is to suspend your preconceived ideas of what an organisation, what a company uh, is about uh, and how you can use counterintuitive uh thinking to create a, a virgin space for you to um, come up with different solutions for people, uh, clients, suppliers, society, the environment, as well as being an economically strong business. Um, and it's important that you kind of suspend that because what what you tend to find is if people go into something with a preconception of what they're going, they're going to be hearing, then you 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 don't open your mind to thinking well how as fully as you you could to how you can implement elements within the strictures of your own organisation your own life um, there will be elements that you can take from this and and try and uh, incorporate within whatever organisation is that you work for um, just a very little insight as to what Webmart does so Webmart is a is the most sustainable marketing. Uh, execution company in the world so we take people's ideas and we market them so but we only deal with uh, companies that are trying to do good we don't there's you know if you think of what marketing does it sells more uh, now if you're selling more bad stuff you're not going to be having the purpose that you want in in uh, in life so we're, we're selective with the kind of people that we deal with we are a b corp we work with a lot of b corps i'm sure you've come across the b uh, the Benefit Corporation is, is a much wider um, kind of uh, mandate, if you like, than just making shareholder value. And we do that by understanding uh, the company's strategy and then executing it in the least carbon footprint way possible. So we have carbon calculators for every media channel. And that's something that we've spent three years doing, not just what scope one and two, but the big one, Scope 3 as well. Uh, and Scope 3 includes biodiversity. It was interesting in the um, the, the Eden event, Anthropy, um, that uh, there's a lot of regulation coming in for large financial organisations where they have to uh, report on the biodiversity impact as well as their carbon impact of their investment. And there's a lot of panicking going on because they haven't a scooby-doo how to go about it. 
So th that's one of my takeaways I got from this is we as as a company, we as as people, enlightened people need to productize what we do. So we make it easy for these companies that now have to report on it and have to have a plan in place to reduce their negative impact and hopefully deliver positive impact um, to make it easy for them to do that. And that's that's my takeaway from the three days that we had down there. Um, what what it means in reality, how it executes is is we do all of the kind of stuff you know that uh, you would see in the world of marketing, be it physical marketing or digital marketing. That's uh, what Webmark does. The origin of of my counterintuitive thinking uh, came from the miners' strike. I'm here in Barnsley. Uh, Barnsley was a huge um, coal mining area. We had 28 pits in in the Barnsley area. Um, and then in uh, 1984, which is a lifetime ago now, um, Margaret Thatcher decided to make a uh, make a stand against the unions, and this area effectively was shut down. We had a, a year long strike um, where the miners were starved out. Uh, I left university at this time and had to move down south to get jobs. Otherwise, I'd just be sitting here um, in the uh, on the dole. Um, but it it opened my, my my eyes to the fact that rather like you know a knife, it can be used for good things like you know a, in a surgeon's hand, or it can be used to kill people uh, in bad people's hands. And the political power is like that as well. It can, it should be used for good, but it it can be used for uh, really bad things. And in this case, you know, thirty years on, we're still suffering from uh, a lot of the deprivation that was there. Still a third of uh, the families in Barnsley live in poverty. Um, and we're working, striving every day to reduce that number and to make it a better place. But it opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, the, there is huge inequality in, in the uh, world. Um, and it was writ large there, you know, the, there's human exploitation, you know, those with power use it against other people. Because capitalism doesn't bring in these externalities of the cold, of environmental destruction and biodiversity loss, um, it really made me think this this isn't right. And then, of course, it's the vested interest. The people who talk in a certain way that come from a certain background, very narrow uh, strata of society that wield either overtly or covertly, the political power. And politics is important because it actually defines the rules that we have to live our, our lives by. So it's important that we engage with it rather than just saying, oh, everyone's the same. Make a difference. And, and if we want to drive systemic change, uh, politics is an important thing that you need to get into, even if you don't want to. And I don't want to. It's not, I've got no interest in being a politician, but I've got a huge interest in in uh, driving change um, and it, in this case uh, Yorkshire has 5.5 million people so I stand for a, a devolutionist party called the Yorkshire party so it's not going for independence that would be silly but it, it is going for a strong regional parliament like Scotland has got which, which has got a very similar population or Ireland you know who've gone the other way they have got independence of course but you look at the economic well-being that they've created since then so it's, it, I want to take the, the the power away from people like Johnson and uh, Reese Mogg and uh, give it to people who've got real world experience. And you know, it's interesting when you know you you have have the veil of the decision making lifted up, like we've seen in the last week in the COVID inquiry. All of the preconceptions of how shambolic it is are writ large and actually fact. You know, this isn't something that you just think, oh, well, it's, you know, you're bigoted or biased against uh, people who walk, walk and talk and, talk and are in a certain way. You know, they have this kind of uh, elitist view on life uh, where they feel it's OK to decide who lives and dies and think, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. So these are the kind of things that I've, I felt were fundamentally wrong. And I wanted to do something different about it. What it means is when you have people in power like that, they start measuring things we actually don't mean anything to anybody's real life. And the you know, GDP is a good example, created in the 1930s by the Fed in America. 
now it's seen as the holy grail of uh, whether an economy is doing well. But of course, you know, as uh, as we all know, it doesn't actually measure the things that matter to us uh, in life, the things that give you a good quality of life. Uh, it, there's a book called The Good Life, um, which I haven't read yet, but I've read the Wikipedia summary. I've got it in me to, to read. It's the world's longest study of what makes people happy. 80 years it's been going, run by Harvard. And uh, we all know it's the things like, you know, human interaction, feeling of belonging with the place that you're in, security and all those kind of things, none of which is measured by GDP. So we've given a false narrative to run to and we blindly follow it. And of course, we know we can't have growth forever. It's a, it's a fallacy. We've run out of uh, the resources to do that. So we need to think of a, a different way of doing it. And when you index GDP against happiness, uh, you see, strikingly, there is no correlation between a rising GDP and rising happiness. No shit Einstein, you know, because it's not measuring the things that that, that matter in life. Um, and also, if you if you take it from the macro economy to a micro economy, you know, business people are portrayed because they've, you know, it's good TV as these kind of arrogant uh conceited uh, egotistical people and it does a huge disservice to you know the uh uk plc and the wider because people think i don't want to be like them you know i want to be successful but i want to be me i want to be happy uh with and content in myself and when you have things like this being shown on tv you know with these people being you know condescending dog eat dog and all this kind of stuff you and i know that that isn't how businesses you can't run a successful business in with the kind of stereotypes that you see in front of you and it puts off a lot of young entrepreneurs who say actually i don't want to i don't want to turn into these people so it's important to redefine the narrative of what success looks like so i did a bit of research and this is um an example of, of you know your life a uh, lifelong spending so when you're young you have very little money and you know you 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 have the kind of uh, opportunities to go to university hopefully and you, you, you then hopefully get into a relationship you, you start acquiring goods and then you get a home and then you, you you get a bigger home as you get if you get a family or you have more more financial assets it, the peak of your spending typically is around 48 where you've got everything that you want and that, and then you actually actually start to downsize because you've you know everything you buy comes with admin um you have to insure it you have to look after it you have to mend it you have to whatever and people think actually i don't need uh as much clutter in my life as i did and so generally you have a general uh reduction in the amount you spend over life uh until you you're old, older age there is also another uh graph of lifelong uh of your lifelong um, status. And this is on happiness. It's from The Economist. And I, it was really, in, really encouraging when I saw this because I thought, well, you know, you start happy and then you have a, you know, a gentle slope towards misery and death. But reassuringly, my friends, it isn't like that. It is a U shape. And what you tend to find is, you know, you start off happy and you haven't got any worries and what have you. And as you get more stuff, and as you get more things going on in your life and you have, you know, careers and you have stress and you have, you know, things that you have to do with you, you, your life satisfaction goes down, you know. Um, and the nadir of your life is around 50, 50 to 53. And that and thereafter, something remarkable happens. We we start to be comfortable with ourselves. We start to think, this is me. I don't need to be something that some other people expect. I'm happy with me being me, with what I've got. And you start to, your shoulders start to, start to slacken and you start to actually do the things that you want to do rather than other people insist on you doing and spending more time generally outside of work, uh, doing, you know, voluntary work or just walking in the countryside and what have you, which is fascinating that, that thereafter you get happier over life which is an encouraging takeaway if nothing else from this this speech and when you overlay those two elements together actually 
what it kind of shows is this consumer capitalist approach that the more you get, the better, the happier you are, is complete bollocks. You know, there is no correlation in a positive way. It's in an inverse way. You then when you start to take agency of your life and start saying, actually, this is this is me and I'm happy with me. And, you know, other other people are actually quite happy with you as the way you are as well. There's a huge gap between the preconception that we have sold in marketing and in media and in society as the you know buy this and it'll make you happy and you know all of the, all of that kind of stuff and the truth of self-reported happiness and so yeah if you if you want to look into that in, in greater detail the the good life is what it's called and it's I think it came out last year and I I'm going to have a, a over Christmas I'm going to be reading it to myself. What that means in your businesses is that you've got huge amount of disengagement. You know, in worldwide, only 13% of people feel uh, engaged, at, fully engaged at work. In the UK, even worse, 37% of people think their job is completely meaningless. Um, now, this is where AI could, could help uh, to take some of the drudgery out of jobs, and I'll come on to that a little bit later. Uh, but there's a huge, you know, we're paying as business owners, we're paying for 100% of people's time when they're at work. And if there's only 13% of them fully engaged and more work, um, 37% of people not engaged at all and think the job is totally pointless, you're not going to be a successful organisation. So this this does matter. Even if you're the most rabid capitalist, you want to optimise your, you know, your uh, resources to deliver a profitable and happy workforce. Uh, and of course happiness ties in massively with productivity and i just put this quote on here because i liked it you know we work for jobs that we hate so we can buy shit that we don't need and that is the kind of you know the the, the narrative that we live in which is just surreal so unless you take it back and you actually start to think about what you're doing and you start to think about your career and the positive impact that you can do both in and out of work then all of a sudden you can bring the 53 year old you forward into your life rather than waiting till you get there you've got that self-realization that it's down to you what you do with your life you can actually be happier earlier than the global average um by probably not being quite as avid as as you know you, the media tells you to be and other um other actors in the economy tell you to be and just be yourself a little bit early um so i thought well knowing this i want to I, I don't want to um, create a business. I, I felt I needed to. It was always within me. I, I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I enjoy business. I enjoy meeting people. I enjoy selling. You know, it's uh, uh, and selling only though when you're selling to somebody something that they need. Most of the time, most people don't actually understand what they need. And so selling is, is you know, there's an old adage in sales. You've got two of these and one of those and you use them in that proportion. Um, so I, I thought, right, I've worked at companies, been successful in other companies, but they were just didn't care about people. They didn't care about you as a person. And I wanted to create a very different type of business. So this is where Marxist capitalism came about working using capitalism, which is the most efficient way of, of creating economic value, but making it work for not just the owner of the business and the other stakeholders that are in your uh, MMR that you've, you've set your company up with. Um, but work it for the employees, work it for your suppliers, your clients, and of course the planet. And I did a degree in uh, agricultural economics, so I, I was always very interested in, you know, the, uh, the that nexus between economic growth and, and sustainability and, and uh, the environment. And so I wanted to create a, a different type of business that would square all of those conflicting uh, elements that you usually see. Now, you, to be successful, you've got to do what we saw on that, you know, you've got to exploit people, you've got to exploit the planet, you've got to have huge inequality within it, because otherwise there's no entrepreneurial reason to do it and all that, that, that kind of stuff. So I wanted to break out from that. So Webmart has one share that's in a trust that can't be sold. So there's no kind of, uh, there's no shareholder -y kind of thing that causes causes issues because what you tend to find is when you set up businesses at the start, it's the, what, those that get in earliest that get most. 
and then you've got a, you, you're building up an issue when you build, bring in new talent, young talent, different people that you've not you didn't know at the beginning. Then what do you do? You know, you've got to start diluting it. Nobody wants to give it up, especially if it's successful. So I have one share in a trust, and the trust has charitable objectives. So the uh, economic well-being of the people is is written into its uh, into its trust deed. Um, so we've got to be secure. And because, you know, Maslowian hierarchy needs, which I've come on, um, you know, at the bottom is security. That's really, really important. And you look at the VUCA world that you'll be learning all about, you know, all this uncertainty and volatile. So that that stability is really important. But you can do so much more with a business if you look at it in a different way. Um, so this is me, uh, 1996, which uh, setting uh, up Webmart, um to try and actually, and I didn't know if it was going to work. Like everything that's innovative, there's a high degree of uncertainty in it. So I thought, well, I'll give it a go. I might be, I might be wrong. I'm, it may be impossible to create an economically sustainable, profitable business um, that factors in these other things. And uh, so I thought, well, the only one way of finding out is you be your own case study. Uh, and so this is why I set the uh, webmart up in this way. Um, Interestingly, as you go along, it, it, we've never borrowed any money. And that was one of the key tenants, because as soon as you borrow money from a third party, you're living the, by their rules because you have caveats in there. You have you, you, you have a set of agreements that you put in place, which tells how you do. And you have to make sure that you uh, work along those. And I wanted total freedom to do whatever we wanted without anybody telling us because I'd always worked to heavily indebted companies and I realized that leads to a misalignment between common sense and purpose and them wanting their money back so I didn't ne never again so that's allowed us to have uh, a very strong balance sheet over the years and when you've got money in the bank that's great news you can you can be highly innovative you can you can risk some of the money and some of the stuff works out well and then when you have you know things you try things and they don't work out so well so you have you know you sometimes have to take out which is why it's it's gone um a little bit more uh higgledy piggledy in recent years we, we're we're pivoting massively from our her heritage into new uh new technologies and stuff like that and some of it works out and some of it doesn't be you learn from it all the time um and we're also very very tax efficient but when most professionals talk about tax efficiency they talk about paying less tax uh, we don't we are tax efficient for the government we want to pay more tax we all of our bonuses that we do put through payroll at the highest marginal rate of tax that we are we are due to pay we don't have any uh strange kind of um you know financial implements to reduce the tax but we want to pay more tax and the reason we want to pay more tax is because actually tax pays for the things that matter in life in life you know they pay for the nhs they pay for elder care they pay for the, the arts and the natural environment they pay for security and you know we're all realizing how important that is in this the, this world that we live in and private enterprise can't do that as efficiently as the state and i'm the first to hold my hand up and say the way that they treat our tax burden is nowhere near what i think is is good however it's the least worst option if you want to have a, a quality society where people have a good chance of living their best life. So it, I find it as a, very much a positive thing that we pay as much taxes that we can because I'm paying people uh, more money and that's the average uh, income uh, at Webmart. Um, and we are helping uh, society for the things that matter uh, as part of our ev everyday life. Um, and at the same time, because we've got all that money in the bank, we have interest, which we don't have to do anything uh, to, to get. And we also have offices that we rent out to people as part of what we uh, we we do as a, um, a as a business. And all that money goes to charity because we haven't earned, earned it. So that allows us to have a charitable pot. Um, and all of that money, if you look on our uh, statutory accounts, you'll see uh, donation every year. And now in total, we've given uh, to charity, not just the £793,000, but people's time and insight. So each person 
within Webmark gets time out to spend with a charity, and we we positively um, uh, encourage them to to become trustees of charities and use the skill set that we have as an organisation to help the charitable objectives of these organisations. So we we're almost like a uh, charity venture capitalists we give them give them money but we give smart money we give them a network we give them insight we give them all that kind of stuff to make their purpose um more success in helping more impact uh, in society as well so that's really uh, a key part of everything that we do as a you know value proposition if you like to to our employees and uh, it's, it comes out of one of the top reasons that people stay with uh, with webmark it's also important to realize not everybody goes on a global MBA program with an August institution. You know, they a lot of people don't really understand business. And if you look at the the media narrative about what business is, they see it's very different in Webmark than you see on the uh, on the telly. So it's it's for, it's important for us to to educate people and make business as simple as it possibly can. Be, so that everybody is engaged and understands where we're doing so we share the management accounts we share all of the ups and downs uh, uh, on a monthly basis and, and keep it very simple um so we all know what snakes and ladders is and i think business is like snakes and ladders clarity of objective is really important what is your 100 and the if it's you know making the person with shitload of money a bit more money that's not really going to drive people on so having clarity of number 100 is important and then you know you start at the bottom and you've got a very laborious way of doing it if you get work all the way through and what have you but there's a faster way of doing it and these are the ladders and this is what comes out of a network you know network of people paying it forward uh helping people supporting people for no expectation of anything but helping as many people as you can what you tend to find is you have a almost like a, a warm ecosystem around you that is spending time on your behalf, uh, unknown, unbeknownst to you, finding ladders for your organisation and helping you to avoid snakes so that take you back down. And this is an unpaid army of people because for whatever reason, like today, I'm, I'm getting nothing out of this other than to uh, say hello to you nice people. Um, but there is a principle of reciprocity in humans somewhere in here that if you pay forward somehow you'll think actually at, at some point there'll, there'll be something that you can help it'll help you and you you'll try and help somebody else so you pay it forward or you might even see somebody and say you know simon i got hold of you on linkedin and uh i've just seen this and i thought you might be interested in it and those are the kind of things that's the where snakes and ladders comes in it helps you get to where you want to be quicker more efficiently and with less pain and anguish than if you do it both laboriously or you keep feeling like looks are not working for you because you've hit a snake um so that's the kind of the the web mark where it where it is now and we've got a 92 percent positive engagement independently assessed um for web mark as, as a team working at web mark which is obviously in the, the the very top echelons of um business in in the uk and i'd argue probably anywhere in in the world because because we're all working together and it, it with a clear purpose of making the world a better place so how do we do this well as you all know if you can't measure it you can't manage it but mo the trouble with most organizations is they only measure one thing the financial gain that you get from doing it and ignore all the other externalities as they see it in terms of people's well-being and societal well game and what have you but we always index thing not only against finance but we index it against three things which is the intellectual return we can get from doing or, or in part to people the emotional return and then finally as an outcome of doing that the financial return because if you're if you've got an intellectual high ground, you've got thought leadership, you've got in, you've got innovation and insight that other people can't get, and you communicate it through engaged and happy people who are good communicators and they're listening, actively listening, before uh, putting a proposition together that's highly targeted to whatever it is that you want to achieve in your marketplace, 
no shit Einstein, people want to work with those people. And as a consequence of that, they give you money, which is a good thing in a capitalist business and in society generally. So this is where we are slightly different from uh, most organizations. Um, what this means at an individual level, chunking it down to that, is that we, it is imperative that we understand what you're good at. So we have to listen, we have to understand that as a person, there are things within your role that you enjoy doing, uh, uh, that you're good at, and the things that you're less good at, and this is where AI hopefully will support us in that ongoing uh, drive to take out mon the mundane and to augment the role of everybody there. So our our role as a leadership team is to make sure that we wrap the job around the person's unique attributes rather than shoehorning them into a particular job that we as a business need to do. Um, if you do that, then they feel that they're growing. They feel that they're delighted with the uh, uh, with being at Webmart and the lifelong learning that it brings, but also the economic well-being as an outcome of that. Because if you're doing the right thing for your psychology, understanding the right role, aligned to a purpose of the organization, of course, um, you enjoy it, you enjoy it and do that. People are giving you more money. We can give you more money. Everybody gains out of it through the uh, redistribution that we have. So it's a, it, it's a virtuous cycle. Um, <clears throat> but also, we don't just look at us. You know, business is quite osmotic these days. It's quite porous. And if you look at most organizations, so, um, you know, I was talking to somebody at BMW. I said to him, what, what proportion of the IP that a, a BMW car has do you... Do you uh, Think comes from your suppliers they said roughly about this is head of supply chain at the time this is in the mini factory in oxford and it's roughly about 80 percent it's huge amount that you get from your suppliers so you've got to look at your to me suppliers are more important than customers because if i get unique insight and innovation from my suppliers i can spread it through all customers i can use that in every customer that we deal with Rarely is that uh, the case with cus with customer insight. You can't spread it through all of the customers or into your supply chain. So engage with your suppliers and your customers in a peer-to-peer -peer relationship rather than, you know, client-supplier or uh, in either way. You know, peer-to-peer -peer is, is the most enlightened form of relationship and trust is the most efficient way of working in that. Um, and then, of course, you know, through the, on engaging with customers and suppliers, there is this little yellow blob called Webmart, which uh, benefits from being as efficient as possible and as uh, curious as possible on both sides. So we understand and we can target it, uh, the offer that we have to them ever much better than we uh, than anybody else in our marketplace. Um, as a leadership team, that that goes into certain key traits that you have to have. Uh, to deliver an authentic leadership style. And obviously, transparency is, to me, the second most powerful force on Earth after uh, gravity. Um, it's really efficient as well. Uh, if you've got one version of truth that everybody can, uh, can have, then you don't have to have bureaucracy. It is what it is. And so the more transparent you are with your suppliers, with your customers, um, then the more efficient you work. Uh, and that breeds trust um because obviously you know you've seen with covid inquiries and ad, ad nauseum other things you know as soon as you lift the veil of the private comms and they're very different from the public comms that they were saying at the time and indeed their deeds that they were doing at the time then who'd have, who'd have believed it people think to politicians they're all a bunch of wankers and i don't want to deal with them and, that, and that's a tragedy because they're not there's a lot of really good people but the vested interests look after themselves whereas if you look at a local level you know, i don't know if any of you know local councillors or stuff they're really honest any party really honest decent people are, uh, in my experience so this this power thing comes and corrupts and this elitist and uh, elitist approach to life that you know we, we, we you know we were born into doing this we were you know these are the uh that that really skews things and if there's a leadership style in an organization you have that you know prima inter pares about what you do and how you do it and you know the little people don't need to know what you do you you lose trust and you get disengagement and you lose your best people 
Um, so always, you've got to tell the truth, even if it's painful, even if it's awful, tell the truth. And if you've got the trust, people will stick with you. And that's a key thing. That's that that's authenticity, that provenance. That's and you deserve to be a good leader if you do those kind of things. Um, I genuinely believe these days you can't outcompete in a capitalist system. Is you know cons, cons, capitalist destruction and whatever. But, but in these days, ever more so, you can out collaborate. Um, because if you have that trusted relationship with all those people and other people who offer similar services to you, there is always a way to work together. Uh, and that is a big comparative advantage over other people who are, think of a zero sum game that if, if you know, we win a, a, a contract, then somebody's lost. We always try and co-create together. And actually, it's a much more pleasant way of being, makes it much more enjoyable as a leadership team and as a uh, anybody in the organisation, but it's a different skill set. Um, and we have to have clarity, that 100 in the top of the net, snakes and ladders. You've got to reinforce it, you've got to be clear about what that is. You know, we want to be a case study to be the best business in the world. And we do that by engaging everybody who we can in a positive way and we can be open with everybody. And uh, one of the things I got out of uh, Eden was this making the pro making what we do as a product that other people can copy uh, or they may want a bit of consultancy on how it does it. We, we sell our, our, our experience that way as well, which we don't do at the moment. We just do things like this and let people go away. But there is a there is a product opportunity for that. So that's again by sharing other people's insight, it gives you a unique insight yourself. So how do we measure the intellectual value? Well, we ask them. Um, we ask people a, a, on a regular basis every six months. Um, what's the best thing about their job? What do they want to learn going forwards? And what do you not want to do? What do you hate doing? What's the what's the most painful bit of, of your job? And also, how many times do you do things? So automation has to come into it. You, want, you don't want people, if uh, low value added activity, we want to automate and eliminate from their roles. So you do that on an ongoing basis. And, uh, you know, people have what they call squiggly careers. They can go from one side to the other. So, ex for example, there's Richard Boone, who's now, uh, chief exec of Webmark, 35-year-old Richard, and he started with us as 18-year-old Richard in IT support uh, and doing project managers. Um, and so he's gone around a load of other kind of roles, and it, it, he's now in charge of delivering forward. And of course, because he's gone through that, he, ca he carries it forward in lots of different uh, ways. But we also try and give for somebody, even if they apply for a job and don't get it with us, we try and give some something back. So we do a free psychometric um, with um, everybody who gives uh, gives a job application in. So they go away and understand a bit more about themselves because quite a lot of times you may have heard of psychometrics and enneagrams and all of the, uh, you know, the Myers-Briggs of the world and stuff. But most, you know, 99% of the population haven't. So we've got a free one that we do. We learn a lot about the inner drivers of a person because the core values are really important to us. Um, uh, so we want to know that as early as possible. And we also want people to go away with something so they understand themselves a bit better so that they can, it actually helps you to understand uh, your career path and have agency in where you're going rather than feel you, you take it swept along by, by other people. And then as soon as, uh, they come in, whoever they are, they do a video before they join, which gives insight. I won't do the, the video, but some of them are uh, uh, fabulous. Uh, very, very, and you, you know the person before they join, which is important. You know their interests and what have you, and that allows them to hit the ground running in intellectually because people can talk to them about sometimes their side hustle as well. Uh, uh, now I've got this is what this is one guy who happened to be an author as well in his spare time, and then um, at three months and six months into your um, probationary period, all of the team rank you on your performance anonymously. Every person, uh, because you can blag an interview often, but you can't blag three and six months. So we put we ask them, you know, how what's their capability to do the job, their passion, and their potential to be a long term web martyr. Uh, things that they're great about, which obviously gives them uh, a feeling of appreciation, and also areas of development, things that they could well do with more. So it's a proper personal development plan, crowdsourced from the team, 
from uh, the th uh, three months and six months. And once you get through it, you are a, f a full time web marketer. And if you don't get through it, then you've learned quite a lot about yourself as well. Uh, and then on an ongoing basis, we do annual reviews. And mine's made public and Boonas is made public now. Everyone else is between themselves and their line manager. Um, and this allows us all to have that, you know, honesty all the way through your career, no matter how uh, many years that you, you've been there. And then the people who are the best, and this is, how do you define the best? These are the most influential people. And that's the individual score times, the amount of people that they interact with on a daily basis. And quite often these are support staff and people that wouldn't naturally uh, be given this kind of moniker as the most influential people in uh, the business. Um, and uh, that stays up with rolling big screens uh, in the offices and uh, working from home where live metrics come up and uh, th this stays with them for six months as a uh, appreciation. Obviously, <clears throat> management style has changed, thankfully, has, has uh, changed quite a bit over the years. And it used to be, the you know, and still is sadly on TV. It's the left-hand side of this that people uh, see as being a good leader, you know, the rigid, aggressive, you know, uh, uh, dashing person who kind of sweeps everybody uh, before them and is very decisive and whatever. But the reality of the, the situation is that it's the ones on the right uh, that people really appreciate these days. And I think, you know, it's a bit common sense, really. People want to, you know, having gone through the things that we've gone through as a business and a society, people want a more empathetic style, a more uh, engaged personal style and a more coll collegiate kind of approach to um, to uh, leading than they did in the past. And, you know, you've got to reflect that. You've got to, you know, it's not always that hard, uh, that easy for, for you to change your style, but, you know, it really is important if you want to get the the best out of your team to, you know, reflect on what your, what impact you have got. And have, that goes back to that transparency and honesty and people saying to me, do you realise that you really upset somebody? Because you, you, you may not. Um, and uh, so then you can apologise and you can, you can understand, you can, you can learn, uh, learn about it. And these are really important factors. Um, interesting uh, stack, if you want the best talent, it's, it's personal development that, that that's the uh, most important thing that young people want. So that's where that continual professional development is really important for everybody in the organisation, not just the high flyers and the... Uh, the senior people, everybody wants to have a bespoke program to deliver uh, the best that they possibly can uh, in their role. And of course, as they evolve and their life needs evolve and their talent evolves and their experience evolves, you've got to keep pushing on and giving people the opportunity to maximize the IEF, the intellectual, emotional and financial uh, value of uh, working in your organization and keeping them for the, for the long time. <laughs> And I mentioned earlier about artificial intelligence, and this is an interesting kind of graph. Uh, if you look at, and funnily enough, at Aiden, there was a guy that um, was staying, I was staying with Tim Smith, who kind of did Eden. So he, he knows loads of dead interesting people. And one of them was a guy called uh, Adam Beaumont, who um, actually on the, what is it today? Some Saturday. So on the Thursday, he was traveling from Eden down to meet Elon Musk in, uh, in, in London uh, to talk about AI and the, the, the scary bits of it. He, he's a cyber expert, um, but also the opportunity of it. And I like, you know, I think what came out of it is so that there's an 80% chance it's a positive thing. And I think it probably is, but it, you know, asterisk, it, it could kill us all. Um, but if in business, what I want to do is to focus and train the, the continual professional development away from the mundane and boring because ai will do that um and so if you look at this this uh, boston grid effectively you've got where well, you've got human empathy needed and you've got creativity and strategy that is the sweet spot for human activity going forward anything out of that to a greater degree or wholly will be done by ai enabled workflows processes insight what have you in in my round obviously i'm talking about brain stuff here not physical stuff um <clears throat> although a number of physical things can be done now with care bots in um, 
in Japan and things like that, which are uh, actually now working. Um, so that's important as a leadership uh, team, as you know, within your organisation to understand how quickly this is going to come about. You know, the internet took 20 years really to be revolutionary. Um, this is probably going to be 24 months uh, for it. We're already using it in our, our creative team for doing uh, uh, creatives for customers. We're doing it in our software team. So we, you know, we used to do pair programming, and now ChatGPT 4 Pro is the pair. So you've got intelligent people doing the, you know, who what doing the specification in. It does the coding, and they can they read the coding and and tweak it and what have you to to make it so it gives the desired outcome, and then deploy at speed like you could never believe. Which is why coding isn't probably uh, the white hot um, career choice um, going forward that it was, you know, in COVID, um, because I, I can get double the productivity out of the existing team that we need, and using tools like you know ChatGPT can do. 50 really well can uh, do 50 languages you know it can do real-time translation of english into 50 languages and then retranslate it back some we've had lots of translation engines before they're not very good uh, this one is so now we're looking at right how do we go global how do we instead of being a uk uh, marketing services agency how do we use the technology that we've got the approach that we've got to go global without uh, investing in huge amount of infrastructure and costs and that's the exciting bit so we, you know we're in the next three years we're aiming to uh, go to 100 million we're about 20 million now um, with mod moderate uh, growth of headcount certainly nothing like the that proportionately using technology like this and so we've got a shadow board of younger members of staff to go alongside in our meetings uh, that we have senior senior meetings and review meetings with customers and, stuff, and try and look at it from a different angle. How can we automate these things? So the trouble is you're very busy with the day job and what have you. How, how are you going to have time to do that? So we bring in younger talent to sit alongside us and then go away as a side hustle project within their role to to look at the the AI options of, for automation and elimination of some of the elements that we can do. So we can push people's careers into uh, the more interpersonal stuff. So I've talked about active listening quite a lot, but reading body language, communication skills, empathetic questioning, you know, mentoring, under uh, all of those kind of things, which, you know, computers won't do in the uh, near future, or some would argue in, the, in a very long future. Um, and also think, teasing out of that, the creativity and the strategy and the insight that you need to carry on being unique as a... Uh, as a business going forward so that that is quite an in, in, important graph um and of course helping with courses like this there's a lot of free ones as well as paid for ones but bringing you into attention and dropping those in as and when they have the opportunity to do it what i always did it's it's easier for me now because i'm exec chair i'm not ceo uh, what i used to do because people say how do you get time to look into these things and i'm like I've got, you know, working all those God sends and then I get home and family on it. What I did was uh, for years, I had a DIY MBA and that was half a day a week that was blocked in. The only thing that was static in my life. And I used to, I know where I work best. So, and I used to have a camper van, go into the hills, uh, listen to me music, cups of tea and read things and do things half, half a day. And that was my DIY MBA. I didn't have time uh, to uh, go and do a full one. Um, uh, but you can always make a space, even if it's a couple of hours in a week, to do your continual professional development. You're obviously doing an MBA now, but um, you, once you've done it and you've got it, and congratulations, I'm sure you'll all pass. The uh, you will the pace of change in this world is such that you will need to continually upgrade your your skill set, and having a little space blocked in your diary. Uh, is a really cheap and effective way. And I used to save stuff that I read, you know, to read in that time, because otherwise you, you're trying to fit it in between conflicting uh, needs. Um, and that allowed me also to give 10% of my time to non-commercial stuff. So, you know, helping uh, schools, uh, universities, uh, uh, charity sector, back in the day with the religion you used to have a, a religious tithe you gave them 10% of your 
uh, income to the church. And this is a modern twist on it. I'm not religious at all, but I do want to pay it forward. And one of the key things you get out if you go to Silicon Valley, other than the risk appetite of capital, is that entrepreneurs there and successful people do pay it forward. It's a really, they try and help the next generation of it. Whereas tend to be in the UK, we go and sit on a farm and uh, buy another yacht and go and get another house, you know. So giving a bit of time to others to help them is a really, really kind of important thing. Um, so to do this and to enable this, you've got to invert your management hierarchy. It's my responsibility to offer the a critical friend role to the to the leadership team. Um, but you tend to find that innovation is really at the t at the the cold face, as it were, between the staff that are dealing with frontline customers and suppliers and our customers and suppliers and that's where innovation is and our job is to harvest that and to implement that as quickly as possible those insights and whatever you, and spread it throughout our customer base as quickly as possible so they need to have time to do that as well which is again where automation will help them to have more time so that they can everybody within the organization has that time to be the best version of they can so they can get in that top right quadrant of personal empathy and and insight so you get a very innovative organization going through. Um, and instead of leadership, mentoring is a much nicer way of doing it. You, of course, you've got to have KPIs, you've got to have this and the other. But the way you go about it is a much more uh, empathetic way. And, you know, you can have peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, and I have mentors as well as, as mentoring people. Um, and then checking the pulse. Happiness is the pulse of your organization. It's the, it's the blood supply. So we have a screens uh, at home and uh, just to say, how happy are you today? And we measure that as an ongoing basis. And then and we have well-being surveys and all of that kind of stuff, which is uh, pretty, pretty important. Um, and because the whole family, you know, there's an old adage that says you're only as happy as your least happy child. Um, and so we want our, their children to be happy as well. So we do, we, we have the Webmart Oxygen Farm, which is an eco lodge in 164 acres that we use some of the cash from the balance sheet to turn it into an asset. So the balance sheet's the same. We turn cash, we bought this oxygen farm and uh, it's got an award winning eco lodge on there and everybody in Webmart gets a free week to stay there a year. And that's another of the top three things that people love about working at Webmart. And that's something I'm going to productize because I'm going up there next uh, couple of weeks time with three other companies that wanted to do the same thing. I'm, I'm just thinking, instead of just telling them and showing them and, you know, it's got 27 ponds on it now. The biodiversity is amazing. And having you and my, um, my colleague, uh, my mycologists going out and doing mushroom surveys and, and, and look at the biodiversity growing with uh, uh, naturalists out there. Let's make it as a product that we can sell to other organisations to drive better carbon sequestration, better biodiversity, better well-being of people. You know, it is unusual when we did it 10 years ago. Uh, now it's coming more mainstream. People want to know more about these kind of things. And of course, uh, you know, in the day, world of uh, net zero, we are carbon negative to the uh, tune of, Oh, sorry, carbon positive. I was actually actually asking some of these um, very august scientists at this thing, and neither of them could agree on uh, whether we're carbon negative or carbon positive. But either which way, we we're much better than most companies, and we we offset everything through sequestration rather than offsetting, which is which is important. Um, <clears throat> and also, it it gives great well being being there and in the workplace. But there's always times that people find it difficult, not necessarily just staff, but staff members, wider society. So we we give people um, £500 uh, a year for counselling. They, if they don't need it, they've got to give it to somebody. Uh, somebody that they know, somebody down at a pub, somebody down at the um, uh, member of family uh, or whatever to support them because the NHS is, is woefully inadequate in that for obvious reasons. Um, but we want people to help people. And if you help somebody, I mean, I'm not going to go into the detail, but my gardener, uh, he, he, he'd lost some hair. I'm like, what's wrong, mate? You, you lose it's, it's serious anxiety. And I put him in touch with somebody that I know. We paid for it. Oh, well, I paid for it, actually. I didn't claim it. But uh, an ex-Webmartier called Lee Smith, who is now a 
uh, NLP practitioner. We helped him because he wanted to do that. So we gave him six months sabbatical to learn how to do it. And he's now a hypnotist. And in three sessions, he's cured him. It's it's incredible. And this guy, uh, you know, I'm not going to the, the wires and wherefores, but he'd been riddled by anxiety for years. So those are the little life-changing things that you can do as a side hustle to the, the core economic well-being that you have as a, a, of an organization it's really important um and we do spend a lot of time in the office less than we used to do but we do spend a lot of time in the office so we want to make it a remarkable place so this is the yellow shed of wonderment as we call it in bista uh, i'm trying to get an alternative one up here a, a more environmentally friendly one uh in in barnsley as well at the moment uh, these are some of the rooms and those screens move so it actually feels like you're uh, in in the uh, air which freaks people out when you're like you're, you're sitting there and they think are you moving and i'm like no 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 but you know it's and it's just having that little kind of it costs us about it only costs about five grand to do that we, we went to a reclaim yard and upcycled it from from an old 737 but it's little things like that that make people interested we've got the gym for you know healthy body healthy mind you're a better person we've got our Elizabethan War Room, where we have strategy meetings in, which is, a again, a bit of a kind of weird thing, but it's in an industrial estate in Vista. Why Why not? Why not make it so it's a distinctive place? Um, and every week, everybody shares. That's Lee, actually, when he was working for us in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, we, we have a weekly update of what's happening in the business. Somebody, vid somebody videos it, and that's the transparency and the trust. And it's, an, it's a nice thing to do at the end of the uh, at the end of the week um and of course because of that it's we have very little bureaucracy relative to other organizations so we can act faster and we are much more efficient which makes us more profitable which makes us more agile uh and means that we can share out more money um three rules of webmark that everybody knows never assume that was the root cause of all fuck ups do not you know if you're ever in a um, in a conversation, you've got something gone wrong. And there'll always be an, assu an assumption in there somewhere, you know. Um, and do anything that you want as long as your mum will be proud of you. Uh, it makes it easy rule set for people to to do. So that's a transparency again and trust of, of, of staff. And never defer. Give it a go. You know, if in doubt, try it. And if it fails, you know, sometimes it does, and uh, you've learned. Uh, but reinforcing people's knowledge that, you know, all these things cost money, but every t and you don't ever see money coming into a business. So we have a screen that every time money goes in the bank, it we, we uh, it comes up on the screen to say we've banked this amount of money with the finance team. Um, and uh, that gives people a reassurance. We share the balance sheet, uh, you know, the cash balances. Um, and it helps people move up towards the self-actualization level of Maslow. Because if you're not worried about the basic and you feel loved and belonged and you've given appreciation, you have triggers in your business for when people do things right as well as when they do things wrong. Uh, you, in, most companies have exception reports when things go wrong and you look at it like, oh, my fucking God. Um, we have an exceptional report as well when things go right. So we have triggers that you can go all the way through business and uh, things get noticed automatically and then you can just send a quick whatsapp video to people say i just know that's fantastic they don't ne necessarily need to know that the, the systems that we've got have actually drawn it to our attention but they really appreciate those little touch points and i'm always sending little videos out to people saying that was great or happy birthday or, i know it's your kid's birthday today can you i'll sing happy birthday to them and they share and it's all those little touch points that cost nothing but actually really do give appreciation and that allows all of the business to spend most of its time at that top layer of uh, maslow which is the most innovative and that's what people are buying off you they're not buying you know take for granted that bit but if you've got engaged people doing that you're uh, you're not one of those companies that have got 13 percent of people engaged you're one of those people with 92 percent of the people engaged you're not nobody has a meaningless job which is great news and of course we are more profitable as a consequence of that so lastly, maximize the financial return. And I realize we're coming up to time. Um, we know that too much money doesn't make you happy. We saw that, you know, the more you spend, the, the less happy in your life stage you are. Um, but not having enough isn't great either. Uh, it's not about me. It's not about making 
more more money than me than I know what to do with because actually that runs counter to what a successful and healthy company is. Individual greed really does destroy the culture that you're trying to, you've worked so hard to get. So being honest and transparent and being fair and equitable and doing only what other people do and making my expenses are transparent to everybody in the business, for example. So everybody can see what you're doing. It breeds that trust and breeds that, that well-being. Because otherwise you end up with people like this. I should have, what's his name, brand on there as well. You know, the it's the people at the top, these egotists that you really don't want anything to do with. And it's the people at the bottom who try to help others that people want to ally themselves with. Because the truth of the matter Nobody ever cares about what you do for yourself, ever. It's a it's a truism. It's what you do for other people that matters, and that's what your you know people look up to you about. So we work out what is enough for the reinvestment in the business to get that balance sheet going like that, and for the ownership group, and then we share out the rest. So we keep four hundred thousand pounds post tax profits as a base retention in the business. And that builds up the balance sheet. And then if we haven't got 400,000 because we've invested in something and it's done, we'll retain less, but we've never not been profitable in a year, in 27 years. Um, and this is how we share it out. We have the retained profits between 400,000 and a million, half goes to the team, half goes to me. Above a million pounds profit, 100% of it goes to the business unit. I get nothing. And that's enough. Obviously, for me, it's enough for the business and it's unlimited the amount of benefit that the business can create for every web marketer. And the highest we've had as a bonus was 88 uh, percent of base salary paid through payroll. Um, obviously, if we're not making as um, anything near as much, they have less. And we, how we do it was the pot of money, the surplus profits, as we call it, um, is divided by the base salary of everybody in there uh, who's been there two years. It's a two-year earning. And then one divided by the other gives a percentage and everybody gets the same percentage. Now, obviously, the cash amount is very different. You know, more senior people get more, but that's fair. But everybody gets the same amount of money. And actually, 20% or 40% or 60% of your base salary, doesn't matter what your base salary is, it means quite a lot to you. Um, so uh, and it and it, it's a central people force. It brings us as a business together. So we use capitalism to create it in this way, uh, and it's exceptional at doing it if you factor in the other externalities that most people ignore and use Marxist principles to share it out prop, uh, fairly and equitably amongst the people that make it. As Marx said in Das Kapital, it's only fair to do. Um, so you know, in synopsis, we have all have uh, choices of how. We want to lead our business. I happen to create this, and this is my choice. This is the way I want to do it. And obviously, it resonates with the team. And there is no losers in this, in the planet, in the um, uh, in society, with our customers, with the most innovative supplier that, that they've got. And some of our customers have stayed with us for 20 years plus. Some of them had, uh, only come, you know, last week at, uh, at Eden. Um, so, but we engage with them in a deep, uh, in a deep and meaningful way. Um, so we have a choice of how we want to to act. You don't have to be like textbooks tell you the media professionals who've all you know, and bankers, accountants, and whatever. You you can be distinctively different and still be conventionally successful in an unconventional way. Run your business how you want to run it, uh, or your department or your team how you want to do it and work around. There's always a way by thinking creatively and laterally of how you can influence elements of this, uh, if not everything, if you're not running your own organisation and do it your own way. It doesn't matter what I do. It's not that this is just my style. Everybody, you know, don't forget the, the these people on screen here were he seen as heretics at the time. And they go, you're mad. Why would you do things like that? Of course, we look back now. And we go, of course, they're insightful, and that you know it felt right. It was the right thing to do, and but people had to stand stand above the parapet and get pilloried, and people go, "You're mad! Why would you? Why would you do that?" And, and so, counterintuitive thinking rarely gets approbation until it's proven successful. Um, so society can be fairer using our Marxist capitalist principles. You know, work can be more interesting and more engaging and, and more uh, rewarding for everybody. Uh, in the business 
and we can certainly make the world a better place through uh, the business activities that we do. Um, so, in synopsis, welcome to Marxist capitalism. It's a, a version of capitalism that is fairer for everybody and better for the world. And I hope you can take some elements away from it and uh, implement it within your life, with inside work and outside work. Um, so on your marks, get set, go.